to this uh, webinar on uh, district heating and cooling. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, this is uh, uh, the fourth webinar in a series on uh, key issues and challenges for smart cities uh, being held during the European Sustainable Energy Week 2016. These webinars are being co-organized and hosted by My Smart City District, which is a cluster of uh, like-minded European smart cities projects representing altogether 25 cities in 13 different countries. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Schmidt from Euris.com and I'm very pleased to host this webinar today on behalf of my colleague uh, Alec Walker-Rov, who cannot unfortunately attend this morning. So as I said, the topic of this webinar is district heating and cooling. According to the EU heating and cooling strategy launched in February 2016, heating and cooling accounts for 50% of uh, the European Union's energy consumption, while renewables for just 18%. So district heating and cooling system can help us addressing two big challenges, that is to say energy demand on one side and reuse of wasted heat and cold. For this session on district heating and cooling, we are delighted to welcome Maya Hockvik from the city of Gothenburg in Sweden, uh, coordinating the Celsius project, and uh, Nina Detlefsen from the Danish uh, District Heating and Cooling Association, Association, representing the Ready project. They will be bringing their national and project experiences to the table today. Uh, we also have uh, an expert commentator, uh, Alessandro Provaggi chairing the DHC Plus technology platform, part of a Euroheat and Power Association, who will be helping us exploring the issues further and bringing an additional international viewpoint. Um, uh, technical information for the participants, you do not have uh, any microphone activated, but uh, you can post a comment or a question in the chat box you can find at uh, the bottom of your screen on the right hand side. I also inform you that the webinar is being recorded and uh, it will be made available on the Mysmar City District website next week. Uh, for those uh, who are familiar with social media and want to post comments on Twitter, you can use the following hashtags you can see in the first slide. So, and now it's uh, time for our speakers to start their presentations and I'm giving over to Maya Hockvik from the city of Gothenburg. Uh, representing the Celsius project. So Maya, you can start whenever you want. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Maya Hagvik and I work for the city of Gothenburg and I represent the Celsius project. I have been invited today to talk about district energy solutions. And it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to discussing with Nina, with Alessandro, with Elizabeth, and of course with all of you who are listening today. And as it is the last day of the policy conference at the EU Sustainable Energy Week, we thought it was a good idea to talk a bit about policies and regulations in the field of district heating and cooling. But first, I would like to make just a quick introduction to the Celsius project. Celsius is a smart cities project funded by the uh, FP7 program uh, with the aim to promote district heating and cooling solutions across Europe. The project is coordinated by the city of Gothenburg together with the utility company Göteborg Energi and the other partners in the consortium are Rotterdam, Genoa, Cologne and London. And in each and every one of the cities we have the local government represented, we have one or more research institutes or universities and also the local utility companies. The total budget for the project is 26 million euros, and we are a five-year project ending in December 2017. Most of the budget goes to building innovative demonstration projects. And two examples are that we are recovering heat from the London underground, and we have also connected a large passenger ferry to the heating grid when she comes to port in Gothenburg. So one of the goals of the project has been to recruit 50 member cities and we are then offering these member cities practical support to overcome technical, financial, social and political barriers to district heating and cooling. And we do this mainly through workshops, through webinars and we have also launched an online wiki toolbox. 
Uh, but I think that above all, uh, Celsius is a platform for knowledge and for networking. Um, our member cities can basically just pick up the phone and give us a call and ask for help and we will direct them to the right expert within the network. So far we have 56 cities across Europe that have signed up and our network is continuously growing. Okay, so district energy. Europe is discarding more waste heat from industrial processes, electricity generation, and other urban services than we need to heat all of our building, buildings. And, and this is rather breathtaking, I must say. It's, it's basically a great energy resource that we are not using. We are just throwing it away, letting it out in the atmosphere or dropping it in our rivers. If we instead could recover this heat, we could drastically reduce the amount of primary energy that we are using for heating in Europe. And as Elizabeth said in her introduction, heating represents almost 50% of the consumption of energy in Europe. The problem, of course, is that we don't have the infrastructure to do this. We need an infrastructure. We need a heating network that can transport this waste heat from where it's produced to where it's needed. And as you can see on the slide, the average market share for district heating in and cooling in Europe is pretty low, almost 13% of the total heat market. And the figures, they vary quite a lot across Europe. As you can see here on this slide, uh, market shares look very different. And myself, coming from Sweden, and Nina, my, the other speaker today, representing Denmark, we are representing countries where the market shares are largest in Europe. Okay, so let's move on to policies and regulations. On the EU policy side, a lot is happening at the moment. As Elisabeth mentioned in her introduction, the Commission launched the first ever heating and cooling strategy in February this year. And that was a great step forward, considering that the heat sector previously has been rather neglected in the EU debate. And as already mentioned, that is quite strange, given that heat represents the largest chunk of our energy consumption and that it today mainly is supplied by fossil fuels in hundreds of millions of small, inefficient boilers. This new strategy, however, it emphasized the role of GHC, and it also emphasized the role that cities will play in decarbonizing the heat sector. We should, of course, rem remember that this is a strategy and it's not a legal document in that sense, but it will, of course, influence the other policies and directives that will come in the coming years. For example, during this year, we have three important directives that will be revised. It's the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, the Renewable Energy Efficiency Directive, sorry, the Renewable Energy Directive, and the Energy Efficiency Directive. And we need to ensure that these directives will create a level playing field for district heating. Because at the moment, we can see that regulation, in many cases, is biased towards building-specific solutions and not district-wide or city-wide solutions. So I'm going to give you one example from Sweden. So one of the implementations, the national implementations of the EU Directive Energy Performance of Buildings, is the Swedish National Building Code. So that's a building code that basically determines the requirements that you need to follow when you are building new or when you are rebuilding. And the building codes cover several areas. They cover fire protection, noise, but also, of course, the requirements for energy performance. And the problem is that their definition of energy performance is not based on how much energy the building actually uses, but on how much energy that is delivered or purchased to the building. So this creates a legal environment that is actually being discriminating district heating solutions. The reason is that if you, for example, have a heat pump inside of your building, then you will only buy energy to run the heat pump. And then the heat pump will create the heat for you inside the building. But if you instead connect your house to a district heating grid, then you will buy all the heat that you're going to use from outside of your building. So the amount of delivered energy will be higher. And then your energy performance score will be lower. So that means that if you install a heat pump, you don't have to spend as much on insulation and glazing to reach the requirements. And you will simply buy, build a less energy efficient envelope. 
So this leads to a situation where we will increase the use of electricity for heating, and we are not making use of all that excess heat that we have available in our cities. So the point is really that you cannot just make energy efficiency measures on building level. You have to look at the building components of a wider energy system and try to improve it as a whole. We need to have a holistic approach when we look at these things. And we should aim towards recycling locally available heat for the heating sector and reduce the primary energy and not to electrify it. So another issue at stake at the moment is that we are waiting for our government to define what a nearly zero energy building is. In the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, it is stated that all new buildings should be, should be nearly zero energy buildings by 2020. The problem is, however, that the guidelines from the Commission about what constitutes, what, what constitutes such a building, they are rather vague, and it's up to the member states to, to make their own definitions. And the Swedish government has suggested that it should be allowed to exclude on-site produced energy from the performance calculations. So that means if you have a solar panel on your roof that produces electricity that you can then run your heat pump, then you don't have to count that energy. So again, this leads to a situation where the indicator does not really reflect the actual energy consumption of the house, and again, discriminates against large-scale heating solutions. We are still waiting for the government to make their decision on this. So it's of most importance that the building codes and the energy performance standards that are flowing from the EU directives, it's important that they will encourage solutions that deliver an overall better energy performance. The playing field in which building and system level heating and cooling are competing needs to be evened out so that we can continue recycle heat and reduce our primary energy consumption. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Maya, for uh, the very interesting presentation and for your overview also and focus on uh, EU regu regulatory frameworks as well as building codes and uh, energy performance standards, which really play a big role in this area of district heating and cooling systems. Uh, now um, I'm giving the floor. I'm giving the floor to Nina Detelevsen from the Danish uh, District Heating and Cooling Association, representing the Ready Project. Thanks a lot, uh, Nina. You can start. Thank you very much. Um, this is Nina Detlefsen from the Danish District Heating Association talking, and thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, seminar today. Um, what I will be talking about is, of course. Uh, well, the, the district heating and cooling as a part of the energy system, and also getting into the ready project, project that I'm presenting today, and uh, giving the ideas of the ready project uh, to see what solutions is, uh, is tested in the ready project uh, in order to uh, improve uh, the energy system. Um, the energy system. Uh, it has changed a lot these years, uh, going from a well, more or less fossil-based uh, energy system towards a much more renewable uh, sources, such as wind power and solar power, and that is also accounts for for the heating. Uh, as Maya just talked about, uh, a lot of heat pumps in the, is uh, introduced uh, to to use electricity to produce heating. But the characteristics of the renewables in the wind power and the solar power is that it's very variable and uncontrolled. So it's not always there when we want, when there's a consumption or there's a need for electricity and heating. Um, so the district heating system is uh, very, very suitable in the in this energy system as a part of. Uh, as it can be used for storage, uh, as in Denmark we are, do not have a lot, a lot of hydro power where we can store uh, energy, uh, we can instead, uh, we see our district heating system as the storage uh, for energy because there we can produce, we don't have to produce and consume at the same time, always. Um, the other thing is cooling, which is sort of the opposite part of heating. Um, which is very suitable in the same sense. It's not quite as old as the uh, heating in Denmark. Uh, we are further north than the most European countries, as you see. 
Um, but we are starting uh, a lot of uh, potential in order to get to the cooling system. Um, so now we get to the, the little bit of history on the district heating and cooling. Um, and there we are getting to this figure that I'm presenting now, um, where we have a development of the district heating system. And uh, when we get into uh, all these renewables, when we started out in the very fossil-based system in the more than 100 years ago, we are getting now into the renewables. You can see that in the wind power and the uh, geothermal and the solar power and so on. Um, what is also interesting in this figure is that in the, uh, in the past times when we had the, we started out in district heating system with a very high temperature and low energy efficiency. And as we try to move on towards the future, we are trying to lower the temperature and uh, getting and raise the efficiency. Um, and in lowering the temperature, it is uh, now into a system where we are looking at very low temperatures, like, such as uh, 55 degrees or so uh, in, the, in, the, in the systems, which means, means that we have much less losses than we used to have in the systems. Uh, the higher efficiency not only comes from uh, from lower losses, but it also comes from a, from combined production, you can say, or you co-produce electricity and heat in the same times and therefore raise the efficiency a lot. Um, the same thing is that accounts from if we co-produce heating and cooling, which is uh, sort of is, which is very much possible during heat pumps, for example. Uh, we will also have high efficiency. We have a little bit struggle right now talking about what is the efficiency when we co-produce these uh, units. Um, in Denmark, we have uh, this tradition of having a lot of combined heat and power plants uh, in, based on, for example, the gas. Um, and they will continue having a, a large role in our system because then we will have a very flexible energy system where we can use the uh, combined heat and power plants when there's not so much renewables uh, and we can use the renewables, for example, with solar heating or uh, heat pumps and so on, when there's a lot of renewables available. Um, one other thing in this part, uh, uh, which is very important for the development, is actually all this regulation part that uh, Maya was talking about. Because uh, earlier on, um, there was high interest uh, rates, and the economy uh, plays a, a big role uh, also through the regulation. Then, if you have high interests, you have a, an incentive to have low investments and high operating costs. Therefore, we had a, a lot of a, sort of a, well with. with with a, a lot of plants built, which was uh, not so expensive to invest in, but had high interest rates. Right now, we see a lot of these units coming in, for example, the heat pumps, that uh, has a, a high uh, investment cost, but very low, inter uh, low operating cost. But, but that's also due to the uh, low interest rates available at, the, at this time. Um, Turning on to the next slide, I will do this shortly. I have a lot of things to do at the same time. We get into this uh, ready project uh, and looking into what is it actually the ready project is. Well, the ready project is a large EU project started uh, in December 2014, uh, where we want we want to test a lot of smart energy solutions in a city, uh, which is creating value for the uh, both for the uh, for the for the owners and but also for the for the energy system, uh, we had there's 23 partners from five countries involved, uh, and you can see on the slide uh, that a lot of different uh, well participants categories are involved. There's going to be physical demonstrations in two cities, one in Aarhus and one in Växjö. Um, and there's a large budget of three, 33 million euros for this project, of which uh, EU's uh, seventh framework program is supporting uh, uh, quite a bit of it. Um, if you look at the right part of this one, we have been, we, we have started now with the best practice uh, 
description of this, and we also in, in have identified all the uh, the the tests or the, all the demonstrations that's going to go on on this, and that will be on the next slides. There's two cities for this, and where there will also be a a, a work program for how to develop this business model and disseminate this in the future. But as it is not that old, the 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 project, we are only one and a half year into the project of five years. Uh, we do not have a lot of results yet, but we uh, do have identified a lot of uh, things to investigate on. Um, in Aarhus, there will mainly be two demonstrations of, here's the first one. Uh, in this one, you will, we will go into a site of a uh, social housing building, which is holding maybe 12 apartments and we will in addition to a renovation of this housing we will test all these uh, smart energy solutions. What is going to be in this uh, solution is for example PV uh, and PV, PV hot water uh, recovery from the roof. It is heat pump recovery there will be uh, batteries to store this energy, but it's the sort of a uh, discussion with what also Maya uh, talked about, this, um, what you call it, uh, individual housing uh, optimization, which is not always good in the big energy system. So we will have to sort of develop the, a balance between the energy system as a whole and this uh, specific housing parts. Uh, what is also in this housing is uh, looking at the uh, flat stations, uh, which is sort of district heating units in individual uh, apartments, which means you can run very low temperatures in the in the network combined to it. Or if you raise the temperature in flat stations, it uh, at at each uh, staircase you can say, or you do it at a building uh, uh, perspective. Uh, so that's different uh, technologies being testing, uh, being tested in this uh, social housing um, the, uh, housing buildings. I think there's three different buildings, and there's also in uh, in, uh, in 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 Sweden in Växjö uh, a, a, a similar building facility that's also been tested there. Uh, the other part of this is that uh, we go into uh, a existing area for single family houses where we want to look into how to renovate these houses or so that we can gradually lower the temperature in the district heating network. And there can be different reasons for this. For example, that uh, you have a more and more people moving into a certain area and the district heating network is, for example, uh, dimensions so it's sort of uh, getting to the limits. And therefore, if you can sort of lower the temperature and therefore you can actually have uh, feed more houses, you can say. Uh, that's one reason for doing this. It's also for lowering the losses. It's for uh, hiring the efficiency uh, of it in general. And of course, the overall measure of this is to energy saving, uh, all the energy you can save and you don't have to use is always the best, you can say. Um, so in this project, so what have we learned so far? Well, it's uh, this regulation and policy parts of, uh, of, uh, of our system or our, our society is very, very uh, important for how we, we act in the real world. Um, what we in this project also we ran into if it's not uh, worth for the individual participants in this or the households to participate in this project, they will not do it. And when it's worth, it's very much to the economic incentive uh, they have in order to do this. And that leads to what it's what kind of energy taxes and subsidies and political barriers in uh, individual countries. countries um, they will control a lot on how uh, individual households uh, act in the, in in this um, and this building regulation part that is talked about in Sweden uh, does not always conform with the overall uh, energy 
what you call the uh, regulatives in uh, EU-wide. The, the incentives are simply not there. Uh, and I think that is uh, one thing for the EU to work further on to, uh, to sort of uh, get this incentives right in order to, uh, to have it more streamlined. Um, so I think one thing is that we test the technological development and test we want to perform. Uh, it will not happen in the long run unless it is supported by the regulative and political system that is set up, uh, well, mainly uh, from the EU uh, to down through the uh, con individual countries. So this is, was my perspective. So I'm very, very happy if, uh, to hear on uh, any other discussion on this. So thank you from my side for now. OK. Thanks a lot, uh, Nina, for having shared uh, your insights and also your lessons learned with us. Uh, both yourself and uh, Maya uh, represent uh, uh, two outstanding countries in uh, district heating and cooling, so Sweden and Denmark. And uh, I'm really interested to, to know the, the comments uh, by uh, Alessandro Provaggi, who is our expert challenger today uh, from the uh, DHC Plus technology platform, part of the Euroheat and Power Association. He will uh, uh, have some questions and comments to the speakers to explore the issue further on. Thanks a lot, Alessandro. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Elizabeth. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thanks very much also to uh, Maya and Nina for the very interesting presentations. I'm Alessandro, uh, head of the DSC Plus Technology Platform. Uh, and as uh, Elizabeth said, we are part of Europe Empower, the European District Eating Association. And at DSC Plus, we uh, promote research in, in JC via uh, EU funded projects and via several education activities and initiatives. Um, so uh, the first questions that I would like to, to ask to, to both Maya and Nina, uh, you presented very interesting uh, scenarios that actually refer mostly to, uh, to your specific countries, uh, Sweden and Denmark. We, we, we see a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in district heating coming from many other European countries that are not the traditional district heating countries. And I'm being very interested in, in, in knowing what is your experience about that. And uh, uh, when you speak with people that are uh, not, let's say, not, not coming from Nordic countries, what, uh, what do they say and how do they see the development of district heating? And, um, and also, if uh, some of these countries are now keen to develop and go further in, in, in developing the uh, height network, what would be the recommendation that you would make uh, to, to, to those countries? So, Nina, you want to reply first, or, or Maya, as you prefer? OK, I, will, I can go first, because uh, I think we, uh, we, all, we have some, a little bit of experience with, uh, with a lot of countries in the EU being very, very interesting in this. And I think when one of the main issues, the reasons for doing it, is that we should just start thinking about this co-production, uh, where we can uh, Combine production, for example, of uh, heating and cooling um, into an uh, in an energy system. When that is said, uh, it, the big problem of this is that you need a lot of investments in order to get started. You need to establish all the infrastructure on this, and it is also, as Maya said uh, in her presentary uh, presentation, uh, that the the regulatory and pol political system is not sort of, uh, it's not so easy to set up measures for, uh, for example, uh, energy saving uh, actions and so on, uh, if uh, for a whole system rather than only doing it on buildings. And that as it is now, it's not uh, supporting each other. And therefore, if you, we, we start, we have a discrepancy between when we talk to, uh, 
local authorities, which is very, very interested, and to the larger scale, because there's the discrepancy on uh, how it uh, suits together. Uh, the local authorities are very, very interested in this, but it's always getting to, well, to uh, actual implementation and the people having to pay for it. And again, then it's a, a matter of, in Denmark we have had a tradition of uh, having a, laid out from, re, from local authorities that uh, certain parts of town has to comply to this. Um, when you are, uh, you can make a business case if 60% uh, uh, attend this, it's a, good, it's a good idea, but if only 50%, it's not a good idea. Then it's always a matter of getting this 50% of the people involved or the people in the local area to uh, to buy this service. Um, it's uh, it's a matter of getting enough uh, getting money to to share for this. Uh, so it is difficult to start up because it's so large an investment. Mm -hmm. and from, okay. From my side, I yeah. think it's. Oh, sorry, if, if I might. <laughs> I think it's interesting because that's a very usual comment, like district heating networks. Of course, they are, of course, they are very common in the north of Europe. But we cannot forget about cooling. I mean, I met a representative from the UN Environmental Program yesterday, and she talked about all the district cooling projects that they were implementing in India. So we see that, I mean, some countries we need more heating than cooling, and in other countries we need more cooling than heating. Um, so we should not forget about the district cooling. And I think it's also interesting that people tend to say that you will have these kinds of large-scale heating system in countries where you have a strong social democratic or, or even socialist tradition. But now we see more and more examples popping up all over Europe. You see district heating networks popping up in London, which is a very liberal market. Uh, so basically, I would say that this is a great infrastructure for cities who would like to decarbonize their energy systems, and, and that goes for all of us. And one last point I would like to make is that uh, it's not only that we have a lot of excess heat in our cities all over Europe, from sewage water, from electricity generation, from industries. We also have a waste management problem. And instead of landfilling waste in Europe, we can then instead recycle it and make, uh, instead of landfilling the waste that you cannot recycle, we can make a great case out of making heat and electricity from it. Okay, thank you very much. Very, very nice uh, interventions full of uh, different uh, uh, points uh, that uh, would be nice to uh, to explore further. Uh, we, I mean, from uh, our point of view as a European association, we also see uh, a lot of interest uh, in cooling, for example, uh, because uh, it's uh, cooling will probably uh, go up the, the consumption of cooling as uh, it happened in US and uh, or Japan or in other uh, developed countries and uh, we really need to to start thinking how we can uh, decarbonize cooling because it's a, it's a it's a good moment to to do it and uh, and and we saw that district heating can district heating and cooling can can really help uh, in this for example, uh, uh, yesterday was a sustainable energy week, and uh, there was a lot of discussions about uh, the free cooling infrastructure serving uh, Paris. Um, and for uh, apart from that, yes, a very interesting example of uh, London, where there is a lot of uh, waste, uh, waste heat around the city, and um, there are many other interesting examples. Munich, I know, is very committed to uh, have a geothermal district heating infrastructure covering 100% of heat uh, by 2040, 2050. So there are many interesting uh, uh, initiatives all around Europe. And uh, and then maybe it brings me to uh, to the next question uh, about uh, the latest trends that you see in the development of district heating cooling. So, for example, um, we may say that that um, that the heat networks has always been very uh, um, connected 
to uh, to cogeneration plants, um, but uh, more and more we see examples of that are quite innovative and creative. Uh, we we saw, for example, uh, that in in London the uh, the metro itself, the underground tube, is a potential source. Of, uh, of heat for for this heating, uh, we saw uh, it was mentioned before the emergence of heat pumps. Uh, overall, how, how do you see in general uh, the the future, the coming 10, 15 years of this heating and cooling? What what are the changes we should expect? Nina. Yes. Um well, I see that uh, that we need uh, there will be a more much more networks involved because I don't uh, think there's so much difference between heating and cooling. I only think that the cooling part is uh, is a bit of, it's a bit behind the heating part, um, because we have a tradition in the Nordic countries in order to do this. Uh, I think there will be established a lot more on. Uh, uh, so you say larger systems of networks where we can sort of be starting uh, exploring this because there is also a lot of uh, potentials in order to have a uh, large scale advantages in uh, building uh, the cooling part um, and primarily I think it's because we uh, we need to to rethink the energy system and uh, and how we can uh, make make much more use uh, of uh, of you can say excess energy when it's there when in 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 all these renewable parts, um, the cooling systems can also uh, well interact very well with the heating parts, uh, but also the cooling parts can come from other sources than the heating parts. And I think we have we are only starting to explore all these sources of cooling that uh, that we haven't seen yet. Uh, so I think also it's uh, very interesting to see what's going to be popping up uh, in the coming years of this. I agree. Maya? Yeah, I agree. I mean, on the technical side, we have a lot of developments. Uh, we have the, the fourth generation with the low temperature grid, and I also believe that more and more cities will look into storage solutions, both long-term seasonal storage, but also short-term storage in buildings, for example, which is something that we are demonstrating in the Celsius project, because that way we can optimize the systems and cut the peaks and then completely phase out the fossil fuels that are being used only during peak hours. Um, so I think in general, uh, if we look at district energy, it has a bright future. It looks positive now. I mean, the Commission has really recognized its potential in the heating and cooling strategy. The UN has a district energy program. And, and also, not the least. I mean, that the fact that we have so many cities across Europe that are interested in joining Celsius, for example, and from all over Europe, Europe to connect to the question we just discussed. I mean, we have member cities in Spain, in Italy, in Poland, in Turkey, uh, in the UK, in France, from all over Europe. So I think we are. I think it's looking quite good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll pick a question that is in the in the chat box. Uh, is a question from uh, Annalise from the City Zen project. Uh, could you compare? I read loud the question. Uh, could you compare the cost of all electric versus uh, district heating for retrofit of residential buildings? Uh, yeah, which which one of you two feels comfortable to reply to the question? Well, I I would, I, I would reply, but I don't know if I have a very clear answer on it because it's very very difficult to give like a, a a fixed number on how how this is calculated. I hope we will be able to calculate this uh, when we get a little further in the ready for it, but we are not there yet. So uh, I'm really sorry for not being able to answer fully on this uh, question because, uh, which is not the case for now. Okay, and uh, I think you also answered uh, via the chat to 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 another question. So. 
I'll, I'll maybe move uh, to uh, to my, my next question. Um, uh, this is more a question related to overall communicating about district heating. And uh, in, in our view, we, we see it. Uh, that the heat networks are essential to car decarbonize the, uh, the the heat sector. Uh, we see everywhere that when cities uh, adopt district heating solution, the share of renewables is uh, is uh, is much higher than when actually uh, they rely on individual systems. And however. When we talk about renewables uh, uh, and, and a sustainable future, it's always a lot uh, about photovoltaic, about windmills, about electric cars, and and somehow the electric cars are, are a bit similar to district heating because they are not per se uh, uh, a way to decarbonize the energy sector, but uh, they are definitely a good a good tool and, and a very practical tool to do it and uh, similar for for district heating and what what do you think we we can do to uh, let me say sell district heating more to the public and what can we do to make it a bit more 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 sexy to the to the general audience my I see you may want to take the floor Hello? Mm. Hello? Alessandra, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, now yes. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> um, from a Swedish perspective, <laughs> I think I think the problem is that it you it works so well that you don't notice it. I mean in Gothenburg, mm -hmm. for example, where I live, the average person wouldn't even know that their house is heated by district heating. Um, because it's just there, it's included in the rent, and it has a like 99.9 something deliver security, and and it, you don't even notice it. It just works. People in Gothenburg they say, oh, but my heating system, I have a radiator. They don't even consider what it's like bringing the heat to the radiator. So I think it's, I mean, windmills and electric cars. That's something you can see, and then it's easier to to think about it. And also, if you have a heating system that causes you a lot of problems then you will also think about it more. So I think that's one reason why, why we don't think about the heating system, because it's underground and you don't see it really, and just, it just works. Um, and then I think it's important to, to emphasize that we need to talk about the system, the district energy system, where the heating infrastructure, the heating network, is an essential part of it. But it's not the only one. I mean, these technologies, they go hand in hand. We, we, we need to have windmills and we need to have electric cars, but we also need to have heating networks. Um, and to <laughs> last point, uh, to, to make it more cool or more sexy or whatever, I think we should, we should really emphasize how much excess heat we are just wasting at the moment. I mean, for me personally, it's just breathtaking how we can just throw away such an energy source. Um, so I think we should probably just be better at communicating that. And and we have we have examples. I mean, from as you just mentioned, that we can recover heat from the metro system and from the data centers. I think that it's really cool. So we should just start communicating it better. Thank you, thank you, Maya. Nina, do you also have other uh, insights? Yeah, well, I have also one more uh, point on this because I, what we are starting discussing is uh, in Denmark is that we should start communicating this a lot more in the, sort of the trends uh, of what is going on. And uh, right now, you actually have a lot more going on that you buy services rather than you buy, uh, well, technique or infrastructure or something like that. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. In order to go get down to ordinary people and to sort of uh, to solve this, we should start to think a lot less uh, engineering and a lot more uh, like in services. So the business models uh, a lot of the companies in Denmark is looking into is that they actually they start selling heat and not um, not and not a unit or a uh, sort of engineering thing. 
uh, like a service, and uh, then you should have to do nothing. It's service that uh, you just have heat all the time, or you just have cooling all the time. You don't have to take care of anything. You don't have to only very little investment, and uh, and so on. And I think yeah, because rather than having individual solutions, you have to sort of uh, decide which uh, size of, uh, of of some kind of engineering or technique you should install. You have to have service people, or you have to. It breaks down and all this. Now you can just buy, like you stream your music, you can you can stream your heat or you can stream your cooling. And I think we have a lot to learn on this uh, part because all these new uh, like business uh, models coming up, how to uh, to put that together and how to also to advertise that and communicate that. And uh, we are only starting there, I think. So that's my point. Okay, thank you very much, Nina. Thank you very much, Maya. Uh, it's very, very, very interesting to to hear your your comments. Um, I don't know if we have uh, time for uh, one more question. Uh, yeah, so we are uh, just Elizabeth. Uh, three minutes after our deadline, but it's okay. I think that uh, we we have for sure time for a, a quick uh, last quick uh, question. So please. Go on, Alessandro. Thank you. Uh, yes. So uh, my last question is basically, um, if since you're talking to to many local authorities, uh, I I I heard from you that in general they are they are very interested in in in, in the option of having uh, the eight networks. Um, so I will leave it a bit open to you if you want to say uh, anything. Uh, what what the local authorities when you talk to them, uh, what they tell you is good. Maybe even what they tell you that is 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 bad or the main challenge it is. In any way, any uh, final remarks you you want to have. Uh, this is uh, this is your last chance, let's say, before we end the webinar. Uh, so maybe we start again from from Nina. And uh... yes, and uh, well, uh, if one should start up a new, uh, you can say, infrastructure on uh, heating and cooling, I think it's very, very important to uh, to have uh, have discussions with local authorities very early on, and to see how much they are backing up on the on the project, because I think that's going to be key issues if you are going to succeed or not. Uh, in order to have it uh, fit into the regulatory uh, work that's going on in this, uh, in this area and so on. So that, that will be my recommendation uh, to do so. Thank you, Nina. Last comments. last comments from my side is that, as I already mentioned, we have cities from all over Europe becoming members of our project and they are different kinds of cities and, and they have different needs. Some are looking into refurbishment, some are looking into cooling, some are more interested in how to recover waste heat. Um, but with that said, they're also I mean they're also they're also talking about the challenges they are facing. They really need our help to overcome the barriers. They're talking about the high upfront costs. I mean how to finance these kinds of large scale infrastructure, how to coordinate all the stakeholders that you need to coordinate in order to recover heat, for example. Um, how to come to an agreement with an industrial waste heat supplier. So I think it's very important that we continue working together and that we, as cities, that we can help each other, cities and utility companies, we need to help each other with best practices, case studies, um, so we don't reinvent the wheel again and make the same mistakes as other cities already have made. So I think that would be my last word. Yeah. Thank you, Maya. I know that you have uh, under Celsius uh, recently released a uh, toolbox for, for cities. So I invite uh, everyone, as particularly the cities, to, to look into that. Uh, so, uh, well, I would like to thank the speakers uh, for, for, for the very interesting uh, presentations and, and contributions. Uh, that I would like to thank the, the audience. Uh, so that's all for me. Um, if uh, yes. Elizabeth, uh, I leave you, leave you the floor. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Alessandra. Just a final few words 
I would also like to, to thank you a lot for chairing and fostering this uh, very interesting discussion. Um, I hope that the participants will have the opportunity also to maybe post their comments also, also via Twitter or whatever, so that we can also reply to other possible questions which have popped up in your mind during this discussion. Uh, just a reminder, tomorrow we will have uh, our last uh, webinar of a series of Lunch Academy webinars uh, organized during the European Sustainable Energy Week 2016. The webinar will uh, be on uh, replication and achieving scale with the participation of uh, uh, two FP7 projects, Symphonia and Citified, both part of my Smart City District uh, uh, cluster of projects. I would like to thank you once again for your uh, participation and uh, I wish you a very nice day. Thank you very much.